Good morning still, I think. Um, welcome. My name is Liam MacArthur. I am one of the Deputy Presiding Officers here in the Scottish Parliament. It's my uh, pleasure to be um, uh, hosting this morning's uh, event. Um, and I should also welcome you to the uh, 19th um, uh, Festival of Politics here in your Scottish Parliament. Um, uh, we're delighted you can uh, join us today uh, and part of this uh, In Conversation event with uh, Dame Evelyn Glennie, OBE. Um, it's brought to you in partnership this year with the Edinburgh International Festival and later I will be inviting you to participate um, in this In Conversation with questions or comments that you wish uh, to make. Um, so let me uh, get on with introducing our guest. Um, Dame Evelyn Glennie OBE is the first person in history to create and sustain a full-time uh, career as a solo percussionist, uh, performing worldwide with the greatest orchestras and artists. She grew up uh, on a farm in the northeast of Scotland uh, and was influenced uh, by Scottish traditional music. I've also learned she has connections to Orkney, um, which I, I suspect most people do when you dig uh, deep enough. Dame Evelyn's uh, 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 hearing declined at the age of eight, but she became a proficient pianist and later was uh, introduced to percussion at the age of 12. Uh, after a few hurdles, uh, when Evelyn made history by challenging and changing the application system to all UK music colleges, and I'm sure we're going to return to that uh, later in the discussion, uh, she gained a place at the Royal Academy of Music in London at the age of 16, where she studied percussion and piano. Uh, she quickly uh, realised there was a, a life for percussion uh, outside the orchestra and became determined to define a new genre of solo uh, percussion. Dame Evelyn paved the, the way for orchestras uh, globally to feature percussion um, concerti when she played the first percussion concerto uh, in the history of the proms at the Royal Albert Hall in 1992. Uh, having recorded over 40, 40 solo recordings and composed 200 pieces of music for various films, TV shows and theatre productions, uh, she has won over 100 international awards and is a double Grammy winner and a BAFTA nominee. In 2012, she collaborated with director Danny Boyle uh, in performing as part of the Olympic Games opening ceremony, leading a thousand drummers as part of the performance and featuring the new instrument, the Glenny Concert um, Alufone, one of three and a half thousand percussion instruments that form part of the Evelyn Glenny collection. Dame Evelyn uh, was awarded an OBE in 1993 and uh, this year uh, was announced as the winner of the prestigious uh, Leone Sunning Music Prize for 2023 with previous recipients including Igor Stravinsky and uh, Yehudi Menuhin. Uh, this is the first time the award has been presented to a percussionist. Dame Evelyn is president of the Help Musicians, a charity that has supported UK mus musicians for over a cent century now, as well as being patron and a supporter of many charities, including Music and Hospital and Arts, uh, Drake Music Scotland and Edinburgh Youth Orchestra, to name but a few. Uh, some of these charities, I'm delighted to say, are represented here in Parliament today. Uh, her unstinting support for young people continued in 2021 when she became Chancellor of Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen. Uh, she's also founded the Evelyn Glennie Foundation, which continues her mission to teach the world to listen. As I say, there'll be an opportunity for you to um, put your own questions, um, uh, make your own comments uh, later on. But let me start, um, Dame Evelyn, by Returning to that theme of um, the application process um, to the Royal Academy, you obviously um, changed the way in which that application uh, process worked, that nobody um, could be rejected without first being um, given an opportunity to be, to be heard. I just wonder what impact both that challenge, but the fact that you overcame that challenge had on the 16-year-old Evelyn Glennie and, and the, I suppose the, the legacy of that for, for you personally going forward has been? 
Well, first of all, thank you very much indeed for the opportunity for me to, to be here and, and to have this discussion. And I'm delighted to uh, receive any thoughts and, and feedback along the way. Um, you know, I think the thing about being young is that uh, a lot of things actually can be very simplified in your mind. So really my aim was at that point was to be the best possible percussionist I could be. Um, what I didn't know growing up in the northeast of Scotland was what was my level uh, in relation to the rest of the country as far as being a percussion player. Um, and so all I could give was the best I possibly could. And, um, and what was very clear in my mind, and this is all about listening to yourself, is what do I want to do? You know, what do I want to do? And I wanted to be a solo percussionist. So the aim was really, really simple. And, uh, and so when I auditioned, I felt I gave the best I possibly could. And uh, however, I was expecting the result to be, well, Evelyn, you know, you need to, uh, you know, just reach a, a higher level. And if that was the case, I would know exactly what I would have to do uh, in order to, to try to be uh, a bit better the next time around. However, when you do have the feedback where, well, yes, you are reaching the level, but we can't take you in because of your hearing, then I have an issue. Because where does this stop? You know, so if someone plays uh, good enough to get in and they have no arms and legs or they're blind or, or whatever the case may be, you know, who's, who's judging this actually? And it's a very dangerous landscape to be. And we're dealing with a profession that is all about connection, you know, building bridges. There, you know, this, this whole profession is, it, it belongs to all of us, you know. It belongs to all of us whilst we're in the, our mother's womb. It belongs to all of us when we're taking our last breath and every part in between of our lives. So um, that is what I realised in learning music at school because we were just you know, busy playing in the community and primary schools and at this community event, at that community event. It, it, you know, it made no difference who our audience was. We were giving 100% and we cared about that occasion. So this was a, a really important landscape for me to, to, to keep very strong in my mind. You know, why are you a musician? And what are you? What does a musician actually do? And, you know, in those years when I was thinking of trying to be the best possible percussionist I could be, I realised this is a never-ending journey. You know, even this morning um, at the hotel, you know, I was practising a certain uh, stroke with my drumsticks on the bed, you know, just going back to very, very basics, practising this, you know, because I've just got this desire to try to improve. Um, however, then I realised, well, what am I? I'm a musician, so my language is dealing with sound. And then I realised, well, you know, everybody has an opinion towards something. So some people might like that piece of music, some people may not like that piece of music. And that's absolutely fine, you know, so you can't really control that. But people do recognise if you give the most honest performance. And I think this was so important when I was auditioning, was for the panel to really listen to the individual. So they could not be in a position where they could think, well, an orchestra won't hire uh, a hearing impaired musician, you know, they don't have a right to say that. So I will take care of that. But as it happens, I wanted to be a solo percussionist. So it was almost like a double whammy for them. So I felt it was important to say something, you know, am I of the standard to get in? Yes or no? The answer was yes. So that came back from them. So therefore, I must get in. It's as simple as that. I must get in. You have to allow somebody to have that place if they've reached the standard to get in. So it was just like simplifying the whole situation. And it took one man on the panel who recognised that, you know, 
they were on dodgy ground here. And so they asked me back for a second edition that had nothing to do with, with percussion playing at all. So it was completely unprepared. And it was sitting at the piano and it was looking at sight reading, at looking at a score, deciding who might have written that piece of music, doing choral reading, full score reading, transposition, you name it. Every aspect of being a musician and I was used to that already. And so at the end of that, they said, you can start in September. And they realized that they have to listen to the individual, not what they see, you know, but what is it with that individual? And it's more than also just the playing, you know, how might that individual fit in? What is it that they, you know, they, they've got to just really zone in on that individual and, and use all the senses possible to connect with that individual. So it, it's, it's a very interesting circumstance. And for me as a performer, you know, I hone into my audience. It isn't just transferring what I've practiced in the privacy of my own four walls and then plonking that on stage at the Usher Hall or the Hub or wherever it might be and hoping the audience might, might enjoy this. It's really grasping, right, who is here right now? You know, what is the message we want to put forward right now? And always thinking about the present and being adaptable enough to, to recognize what, what the situation is right now. That, that, I think, is really important. So that, I think, is what happened at the audition, um, was for, for that panel to zoom in, but also zoom out. And from that, they, they really realise that they, they have to just see people as people, you know, and what is that passion in that person? Hearing you explain that now, it, it all makes perfect sense. I think it, it's, it's recognising, though, that that was your thought process at the age of 16, which for, for many um, people that age can be quite a... Um, a, a difficult, challenging time. They're dealing with lots of things going on in their life. But you seem to have a real confidence, a, 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 a kind of inner strength, a self-confidence. I don't know whether... Did that come from um, the fact that you had been brought up playing, performing music? We were discussing this before we came in about the, um, the skills that that does give young people, that ability to, to perform in, in, in public. Was it, you've also talked about a, a, an inclusive environment in the northeast of Scotland at the time, it be, being a more inclusive community. Did that give a, a kind of confidence um, and a self-confidence to you as a young person, do you think? Yes, I think it was a, a bit of everything, to be honest. I think the whole ethos of the school I went to, which was Ellen Academy, just north of Aberdeen, was that the school believed that every child has a story to tell. And every child does have a story to tell, actually. So within that school, you've got a great engineer, a great politician, a great musician, sports person, debater, uh, baker, plumber, engineer, uh, electrician, whatever it might be. And it's up to the school to plant seeds, but to also fish out what it is in that individual and to then be able to support that in the conversations that are had and how interested you are in that individual. So you don't suddenly have to become a, an expert in, in, in baking or an expert in engineering or something. It's just simply being interested enough to listen to that person. And I'll never forget that, you know, at school I wasn't particularly hot on maths, for example, but my teacher happened to be a very good pianist, and he could see how I became a, a, a different specimen almost in the music department. And so therefore he just changed his vocabulary in the maths class, and that made all the difference. It was just a simple thing like that. It may not have been so simple for him, but he did it. And it's just this kind of paying attention and that's what listening is. It's just paying attention to the circumstance. And, uh, and I think that's why social media is quite difficult to handle um, because you say something, but then, you know, you're not actually listening to what you're saying. You've just written it and then that's that. It's, it, it's there. So that's a whole different kind of uh, meaning, I think, to listening. Um, so, I, uh, yes, I, I just felt that the, the school wasn't about finding the best musicians, but what is it about playing music that gives that person satisfaction? What difference does it make in their lives? So I really feel that music, in a way, 
participating in music, whether it's a listener, whether it's actually playing an instrument, uh, whether it's discovering sound for the first time and thinking about foley and, and soundscapes and all sorts of things, you know, that belongs to us all. It really does. And so that's an extension of our imagination, but also it's an extension of our whole physical body, you know, and often we draw upon music at the time of crisis, you know, and suddenly we have to provide music here, provide music there in order to, to save a situation. But actually, if music is part of our lives right from the beginning, and if we can just find this route where we really do recognize how important it is to our well-being, to, our, 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 um, to all the physical aspects, our balance, our coordination, everything, you know, our giving to, of ourselves, it's, it's really quite, quite amazing, the offshoots of, of music. And also, when you think of music, you know, music consists of practically every subject that a child studies at school. So you're thinking about history, you're thinking about geography, you're thinking about maths, you're thinking about language, you're thinking about technology, you're thinking about acoustics and architecture. You know, you're thinking about all sorts of things um, when you actually dissect music. And, and one of the projects that um, we have been developing over the past few years. There's a project called Sounds of Science um, that was rolled out at the, uh, throughout the Charland Academies in, in Birmingham. And this is just looking back at, you know, the, the history of man-developed sounds. So, you know, you, you start, let's, you can start anywhere, but you start maybe in, in this case with stone tool making. So you clunk stones together and you scrape stones and then a little spark happens and oh, that then ignites fire. So what happened then with fire? So you can create the foley sound, the feel of fire by just scrunching plastic bags or something. Um, and then what did fire mean to the development of man? Well, we could suddenly cook meat on there or we could keep warm and all sorts of things. And, and it goes on and on. So the sound of helium, the sound of Dolly the sheep, the sound of the bicycle bell, the sound of, um, I, I don't know, penicillin, the sound, sound of uh, gravity, the sound of the first computer, the, the sound of silent movies, whatever. So really looking at history and thinking, well, what else was happening when this event occurred? You know, often when we teach music, we may teach, you know, about Beethoven or Handel or Haydn or Shostakovich or something. And that's all we think about. We don't think, well, what was going on in China? What was going on in Latin America? So this project is really zooming out and thinking, well, historically, what was happening there? What other inventions were happening? You know, all sorts of things like that. So a five-year-old can deal with this project along with an 18-year-old. So they're talking about the same project through signs of science, but dealing with all different aspects aspects of their education. That's what I enjoy, really, building the bridges there. And which just underscores the extent to which music or sound can be woven through, through everything. I mean, it's something you, you, you touch on in your TED Talk, in your YouTube videos. For those that haven't watched them, I, I thoroughly, thoroughly um, recommend them. Um, but you talk about music as being almost a daily medicine. Um, and, and, and obviously and a requirement for, for, for everybody in, in, in some shape or, or form. Do you think it's something that we are doing well enough? I mean, there's an awful lot of onus that's always placed on schools and there's a limit to what schools can do. Um, but with the contraction often of extracurricular activities for, for one reason or another, the capacity to pick that up out with school is limited. Are there things that we could be doing better or that, we, or that you see we're doing well and, and that we might look to kind of roll out more, more widely across the country? Absolutely. I mean, we, as a, as a country as a whole, you know, we've been, uh, we've had a very good um, record, I would say, of amateur music making, of community music making, um, of music in our schools, uh, our professional music making and so on. And it's been very, very strong. Absolutely, there have been challenges um, right across the board, no question about that. 
Um, but, you know, things can't remain the same forevermore. So, you know, music is like a river. It, it, it's always flowing. And we always have to ask the question, as the festival is asking now, where do we go from here? You know, so we can't just sit, sit back and think, oh, that's working fine, that's great. So I think that we have always got to communicate with our young people. We have always got to communicate with those who are providing the services and make sure that communication is happening at all times in whichever ways possible. So keeping those avenues open is, is so incredibly important. I think that we can definitely look at our demographics and think about all the different situations um, uh, that people require uh, support. So we might think about uh, music when, uh, you know, mums are pregnant, for example. Um, so how important is that going to be? Not just for the baby, but for the, the, the parents, you know. Um, what about keeping that extension going once the baby is born? What about music in, in preschools? A lot of the questions we get asked um, is, you know, what should primary schools buy as regards to percussion in the budget, with the budget that they might have, you know. Now, very often you'll find that schools have rattles and tambourines and shakers and all of this sort of thing. They're all high-frequency instruments. They're all things that often don't have a long sustain. So the recommendation is think of food, uh, think of sound like, like a, a diet, you know. So how much low frequencies do you have? How much mid frequencies do you have? How much high frequencies do you have? So you're nurturing that sort of um, the senses for a young person through, through sound and through that sound diet. Um, and so thinking about short and long sounds. So, you know, they're already in, kind of in, engrossed with very high cosmetically enhanced sounds through phones and computers and other devices in the home. So the last thing they need are more sounds up in this register of the body. So really thinking about that, right, what sort of low sounds can we bring into their soundscape and so on. So thinking about it like that, thinking about sounds in the, in the whole medical profession, you know, we, we, we think about the colour of the walls, we think about the, the seats we sit on, but do we actually think about the soundscapes? So really communicating with our, our architects, for example. So a lot of the schools for the deaf, for example, that are being built now, the, the new schools, you know, have curved uh, uh, corridors, so where, you know, you're not suddenly spooked by someone coming round uh, a, a corner, or the, the dining areas are, you know, designed in ways where, you know, you're not getting the scraping and the cutlery and all sorts of things, which is very, very painful often for, for deaf people. And, and again, it's just understanding people's circumstances um, and how we can really um, Im Im improve all of our, our, our situations as far as we can. But I think the thing for me uh, as, as a youngster was having those opportunities to perform. I think that was so important, going into primary schools to perform, going into um, uh, homes for the elderly to perform, going into any kind of situation, you know, the Ellen Show or something, and playing outdoors in the square. It didn't matter. It was a chance to perform, because it isn't just the performance, it's the organisation, you know. So it's making sure you've got everything ready, you're there, you're mentally, you know, ready to go, you've got your colleagues to think about. It's more than just striking that drum and and so that sense of responsibility and and willingness and and sharing this responsibility and having a chance to talk about it afterwards and and that's all part of the performance as well i think any opportunity we can to perform and really using our spaces you know as far as possible and this is something that certainly was ignited uh, post pandemic you know it, it, it's absolutely you know the world is our stage that is that's the the, the we perform you know as, as long as we're alive we perform I'm going to open this up um, to, to questions in a second but just one further question for me at this stage you talk about the importance of, of listening and, and um, are perhaps critical of the fact that we don't properly 
listen. I am conscious we are sitting in this parliamentary chamber um, as one of the deputy presiding officers, uh, but also as one of the participating MSPs in debate. I think I can testify to the fact that um, very often or too often we do not listen, even when we are engaged in the debate. But I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit more about what you consider to be um, important in terms of properly listening, um, whether it's to sound or whether, as you were saying before, in a social media context, actually listening to, to what it is that others are, are, are saying. Yep. Well, I think, first of all, for, for, for me anyway, listening starts from within. So, you know, it, it's important to listen to your inner chatter and to, to give yourself that space and, and time to listen to yourself and, and that often sounds quite selfish but it's it's a really necessary activity it really really is just to have that moment of listening to yourself now it might be that you know you don't have an agenda or anything like that it's just quite simply you know being with yourself and and I find that's really necessary for me because you know you're, you're pulled in all different directions and you have all sorts of things coming your way um, but ultimately it's it's going back to that 16 year old what is it that this individual is is listening to and what is it that makes this individual you know really uh, say something and we are we can all say something that's the thing so so you know please don't think this is a, a kind of ego trip or anything like that for for us it, this is necessary for us all to do and and i think that once in a way you've silenced yourself to allow this listening to happen you can then build that bridge and energy to listen to someone else or to a circumstance and you know when i when i'm in the my, my practice room you know I might be striking something and and thinking right how do I want to link that to that and I may spend a a ages thinking how do I want to link that to that and there could be a hundred different ways of linking that to that now you might think well who on earth cares you know at the end of the day who cares but actually it is the difference between feeling something or not feeling something a feeling that that care has been taken or not taken so just boop boop or boop boop You know, what is it that, that you, you want to say? And people will feel that. And listening really is feeling. You know, it isn't about a sound. It isn't about uh, whether you can hear something or not hear something. It is literally about deciding that you want to be in the presence of that situation and receive, you know, and then you'll be able to give. Receive, give, receive, give. So, you know, if I only spent time with my left hand, then this will give up, you know. So everything has to, to, to work together, and that's what listening is as well. So imagine if we were having this, and I keep striking this, imagine if I was having a conversation with you right now, and I had my mobile phone here. Just if I had my mobile phone, how would that change the conversation? If I had my mobile phone and I just... You wouldn't be the it's, first. It's, it's, it, but it makes the difference. It just makes the difference, you know. And, and this is the thing is, is, you know, can you imagine if I gave a performance and my mobile phone was on the music stand, you know, and as the orchestra was playing and, and I had maybe 10 bars or something and I just, oh, just check, you know, how on earth would the audience feel? But yet we feel we can do that with a conversation, you know. And I would just ask if for one day we could pop our mobile phones away whenever we have a conversation and just see, just observe. It may or may not make any difference to you, but just observe if it does and what that difference might be and is it something that we can cultivate. So when I practice, I'm 100% there. If I'm looking at my mobile phone, that is the activity I'm doing, not also whilst I'm practicing. So it's just teeny little things like that that I think would, would help make a difference. I wonder what your 16-year-old self would have said to the putting away of the mobiles for the entire day. <laughs> like that, uh, look, it's time to uh, receive and give, um, open up questions to the audience. Um, if you could raise your hand, um, that will allow 
broadcasting to turn on your microphone. You don't need to do anything, but the microphone um, should uh, come on. There'll be a little red light near the, the tip of it. Um, if I could ask that questions be reasonably succinct, um, uh, then hopefully we can get in um, everybody that wants to ask a question or make a comment. So who's going to get us underway? Gentleman there in the blue shirt, um, four rows back. Thank you. Uh, my name is David Elliott. I'm uh, chairman of Edinburgh Youth Orchestra. Um, I agree, Evelyn, with so much you say about uh, music making in this, in this country, um, professional music making. I've left a, a youth orchestra this morning of 92 who are working hard to, um, to, to practice, to prepare for concerts, given up a week of their, their holidays. But I, and I am optimistic about youth music, but I also have this slight doubt that we are persuading the, the people who make the decisions um, uh, of the value of music in the curriculum. I wonder, uh, curriculum, and I wonder if you think there are things that we could be doing more as, as musicians um, to persuade the, the, the politicians and the, power, the people who make the decisions of the value of music for all our young people. So what could we be doing to persuade politicians to be doing more to support music in this country? Well, I don't think we uh, necessarily have to just land it all on the politicians. And I'm not just saying that because you're here, actually. But, but actually, this, is, this belongs to us all. It's all of our responsibility. And I think that it doesn't also, or it shouldn't also land on the plates of the musicians, because the musicians are already passionate. Musicians are already doing a lot, to be honest. And there's only so much we can do. Um, and I think that it would be great to get other disciplines involved to talk about the power of music, the power of sound, the, the, and, and, and how important it is. So looking at it from a medical point of view, looking at it from a sports point of view, you know, what is it, let's say, in the world of sport um, that makes music important to what they do and the level that they do it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, and looking at many, many different kinds of disciplines, I think it would be great if we could have conversations together uh, so that we, we really learn from each other uh, because, of course, we are dealing with music in so many different situations. And, uh, and it's very difficult when you see uh, the Edinburgh Youth Orchestra with such talented players, they are dedicated players, many will go on to be professional musicians, so, you know, they already know what they're going to be doing or want to do and, and, and so on. So they're giving the audience who's already passionate about music and it could be their families and so on, wanting to support them. So, you know, you've, you've got that enthusiastic environment already, um, but how can we extend that? And I really do feel if we can get the different disciplines uh, involved, then that might really help us. So, you know, I've seen this obviously in, in, uh, in the deaf community, um, where, you know, we, we went from when I was growing up where there's no way you could put deafness and music together because people assumed that deafness was about silence, music is about sound. So there's no way they can meet in, in the middle. Well, of course, all of this has changed, you know, it, it, it really has, and how important music is to deaf people. And technology has also played a part in that. So here, you know, we're, we're talking about technology, you know, we're, we're talking about people's um, perceptions of, of disability. Um, and there's all sorts of things, all sorts of disciplines and people and organizations and communities that can come together and have this kind of conversation of what, why is music so important in our lives, you know, and, and not just have it the, responsib uh, of the responsibility of the politicians or, or musicians and so on. Um, I feel quite strongly about that, really. Thank you very much. Right. Um, gentleman in the front row in the blue jacket. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'd like to just develop a point that uh, David was uh, mentioning a moment or two ago. Uh, my name's Alistair Orr, and I'm a brass instrumental teacher in Stirling. Uh, a wee quick good word for politicians, if I may. Um, thanks to... After a, 10-year campaign, roughly, um, in this place in 2021, the Scottish Parliament removed fees for instrumental tuition being charged by local authorities up and down the country, from Shetland to Gretna. That was a major step after 10 years of hard slog 
getting to get politicians to realise that this was a barrier to the sort of participation that you were talking about at the beginning, Evelyn. Um, but one of the main hangovers from that is, uh, and what David, I think, is getting at, is that in 2007, there were 1,264 instrumental and vocal teachers working in Scotland schools. Today, there are 615. So we've removed a big barrier in terms of cost, but we've got a lot of work to do, which won't be done overnight, um, to try and up the, uh, the, the teachers that are available to teach in schools. And second quick point, where do we go from here? Well, we, where we go from here is what we saw in the Usher Hall last night with the Budapest Festival Orchestra and the, what they showed the future of perhaps orchestral concerts could be. Um, it was amazing. I see Nicola Benedetti sitting by, behind me here. Uh, I say a massive thank you to her and the Edinburgh Festival for organising it. And if you've not got a ticket for the Budapest Festival of Orchestra for the next couple of nights, beg, borrow or steal one because you need to hear them. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Um, plugs are, 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 are also permissible. Um, is there something that we can perhaps do in terms of that point around um, uh, the, um, the teaching profession that is able to, to deliver the instrumental tuition um, both in schools and, and um, probably out with schools as well? Is there more that we can be doing there? Yeah, I mean, we've definitely seen a decline, uh, as, as you'd say, in the, in the instrumental teaching. And we've perhaps got to, to balance this out where, obviously, we're seeing a huge increase in people dealing with music through technology. Um, so a lot of our, our uh, actually incredibly creative uh, uh, composers and, and writers for media uh, music and computer games and film music and, and so on are often people who don't actually play a musical instrument but they're incredibly uh, versatile and, and creative with technology and are creating amazing music scores actually and often then and I'm seeing this myself where um, those types of people are then coming to uh, um, musicians who play instruments to 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 work together, um, not not in all cases. So I think we're seeing this real rise in in people who are um, navigating through technology and doing incredible things. So I think this is just part of the progression that we're experiencing. So although we're seeing a bit of a doomy gloomy picture in one sense, there's also this creative streak that is happening, even if it's not being transferred to the concert hall because it's not that type of thing um, that that can uh, be be easily planted on a, on a stage. Um, but I also think that uh, during the pandemic, there was a huge amount of online resources that were uh, being creative and that have continued, thankfully, um, uh, post-pandemic that allowed young people to access. Um, some of those things I, I, I just thought were absolutely incredible. And Thankfully, they're being supported um, uh, now to keep going because they, they can see the, the value of this so that kids have things to, to access, both school, um, access with their families and so on, and they're getting professional people to contribute to these things as well. And that's all good. Um, so, again, that's with the help of technology that's allowing this to happen. Um, we can connect with all sorts of people on a global basis um, as regards to these online facilities. And, again, that was heightened during the pandemic. So I found myself doing things in primary schools in the middle of nowhere in America, for example, online. And, and that was fantastic, you know, because there's no way I probably would have gone there in person um, you know, if, if we even if we didn't have the pandemic, you know, I just probably wouldn't have gone there. Um, but it was possible to, to access these places, and, and that was really, really great. So I think you know we've we've always got to balance these things. There's always a yin and yang to everything. Um, but I think how we use our spaces, where it's appropriate for one person, two people, three people, four people to perform. That, that's, that's a good thing. You know, it doesn't always have to be at the, the Usher Hall, for example. Um, but I think, you know, where there's a way, there's a will. I really feel that. And, and I think that it's very important that professional musicians like myself, um, you know, 
talk about the importance of playing an instrument that isn't just all about performing that instrument. So what is the process of learning a musical instrument and what does that do, you know, in our particular journey? So it doesn't always have to end up on a platform. Um, that's really, really important. So, you know, for example, one of my brothers um, learned trombone at school. He started when he was 12 and he left school at 16, 17, whatever, and he stopped playing then. But those few years were just incredibly valuable to him as a person. And he's never picked the trombone up again. But that doesn't matter. It's what did it mean? And then what was the impact of that with him moving forward? And, and he still talks about it. So there you go, you know, um, and I think that's really important. And he talks about it where, you know, he will go to a concert or he will, you know, sort of put money if somebody's busking somewhere or, or whatever it, it, it is. So it's just nurturing that right from the get go and, and, and thinking, you know, everybody has their own take on, on, on being involved with music. That point about digital creativity made me think that it may not be long before having your mobile phone on your music stand is entirely legitimate. Um, well, and, 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 and this is it, you know, and, and that's the thing is that, you know, although I don't like to see a, mo a mobile phone, you know, on a music stand, but there, there could be an aspect of that that actually does lead into the creative side um, in what we do musically. So I have to be open enough to think, uh, you know, how that, how that could be. Um, but at the moment, if it's a case of, you know, just scrolling through Instagram or something, um, that, doesn't, that doesn't sit well with me. I've got a, another question in the front row here. Oh, I'm Brandon Gretchen. Good to meet you for real. Thank you for helping me through. Hope I, I think you're all right. Uh, music, poker, forget, hang a pain. I've always, always wanted to do music, learn, but never got a chance to do music through any sort of school or COVID paper. But, yeah, partly what you did, disabled people, yeah, to be created like everyone else in society. People with learning disabilities as well. Everybody should be treated the same. People are of ear and day. Disabled learning music a brilliant thing to help people through their life. And it can come by that person. And we should all learn dynamic, PSL, ASL, whatever, through any time we could all be equal, learn music at the same time. It's all our world. Not only for hearing, not being a bench of choice, it's for deaf as well and disabled. We're all together in the Absolutely, yes, exactly. Thank you for that for that um, for your thoughts there. I think you're absolutely right that music does belong to us all, and I think that's why I feel very strongly about nurturing music right, I mean, as soon as we, you know, are, are in this world. Um, and in a way, you know, it, it's whether we're asking the, the, the question of um, music or sound, uh, because obviously music is, is about sound and, and it stems from sound, um, but it stems from presence as well. You know, music has to start from a space, um, so it has to start from that. 
you know, that, that's where it's, it, it starts. And then we build on that. And, uh, and I think that, you know, as you say, that it, it belongs to us all. And, and how we relate to that um, is something that we have to be able to express. So, you know, it isn't always about finding the next Lang Lang on the piano or something. It, it, it is, what does music mean to me? What does sound mean to me? And sometimes when we think of sound, it, it, it could be, I mean, I don't know, so, you know, we're, we often ask, um, what rhythm do you like? What's your favourite rhythm? What's your favourite piece of music? What's your favourite composer or something? But do we actually ask, what's your favourite sound? You know, I don't think we do, really. What is our favourite sound? So, for me, I really like low sounds. I love the bass drum sounds, you know, much more than a glockenspiel or a cymbal or something. And that has resonance, you know, I just feel it as something velvety. It's something that spans out like this, where there's a chance for the body to digest that sound. Well, that's, that's me, you know. For somebody else, it may mean nothing at all. And that's absolutely fine. Um, but you're right, it is always having this platform where we can just reach out to something that is as necessary as food, water, shelter, a roof over our head. Yes, gentleman in the second row here. I was just wondering what your thoughts or your feelings and connections would be with popular music, jazz music, rock music. I mean, are there many people in that world could do what you do or could you swap places with Stuart Copeland for an afternoon? Or that kind of a, a thing? Or would you see your peer group, if you're talking about sound, your peer group not necessarily being the percussionists, but maybe some guy with keyboards who has an awful lot of sounds at his, his disposal? So, I, could you see the, the interchangeability, I think, of, of different genres of music? So, popular, popular music, um, jazz, etc. Could you see yourself um, performing those roles and, and, and likewise musicians um, from, from, from those genres doing what it is that, that you do? I think that for musicians, they have to listen to themselves. I, I don't think that you can start to say they should or should not do this or that. It, a musician just uh, does and feels what they do uh, naturally. So if someone wants to specialise in jazz and that's where they feel most at home, that's absolutely fine. If it, um, someone's a rock drummer, that's absolutely fine. A timpanist in an orchestra, that's absolutely fine. It's recognising what makes them you know, really come alive and where their curiosity, their natural curiosity might be. Um, it's making sure that they will have a platform uh, in order to uh, present what they, they do. Um, and I think that's the power of festivals, really. It's the power of um, something that belongs to the community because the community um, really likes to reach out to different aspects of music. Some people like opera, some people like classical, some people love to see, you know, a youth orchestra, some people like to see a, a folk group and so on. And, and, you know, all of those things need to be celebrated for sure and they're all relevant actually um, but because we're inclined to say well I like that and I don't like that that's absolutely fine but I think music institutions uh, can really help to bring uh, and build some of these bridges in connection uh, with the different disciplines of music um, so you know we're, we've seen this a lot with the Royal uh, Scottish Conservatoire with the traditional music and contemporary music you know it's quite fascinating how these two sort of arms have come together and the kind of new creations that have come about really really interesting I think also musicians are naturally uh, now partly because of social media where they can make these connections directly reaching out to different kinds of musicians and thinking oh you know what might this collaboration look like you know it may not go anywhere but who knows and it's having a chance to explore that um, in my own situation you know I've always seen myself as simply a musician my speciality has been solo percussion and having percussion as a spine run through every project um, but I haven't seen myself as a classical musician a jazz musician or any other type of musician it's just a musician and that means that, you know, you can find yourself in these different landscapes um, and, and feel as though, actually, I, I, I fit in here. I feel as though I belong in here or I belong enough in order to 
explore this kind of possibility. And I think the longevity of our create creativity is about having that platform to explore and always be curious. You know, if suddenly we're hemmed in or hostage to a situation where people expect us to do something in such a way, then that really is, is dangerous ground to be on. I think we, we have to allow our young people to know that they can explore. So if, you know, the leader of the Edinburgh Youth Orchestra um, wants to team up and, and contact, you know, Eminem or, or Kate Bush or something, let that happen, you know, see what happens there. Um, or to, to do a project with Phil Cunningham, let that happen. Let's see what, 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 what's going to happen there. It's, that to me I find fascinating and that's what I love festivals to really explore are these different kinds of, of, of combinations and, and, and letting this, this freedom really, really happen. Um, I'm going to go to the lady at the back and then I'll come back to you. Yes, lady in the fourth row. Hello, um, my name's Zena. I'm a drama teacher. Um, I often find that young people are really scared of making mistakes. They consume a lot of stories, but they don't see themselves as confident story makers. So I really encourage them to enjoy their mistakes and learn from them. And I wondered what was your best mistakes and what have you learned from them? What was your best mistake and what did you learn from it? <laughs> um, my best mistake was not a musical one, actually. Um, uh, no, it was when I first bought my first house in, uh, in or my first flat, I should say, in, in, in London. And uh, I thought that the same system ran up and down the country and that you paid the, the, the asking price, which was the case that, that happened in Scotland. And uh, so that was a, a big mistake I made, but there we go. Uh, you, you live and learn, but um, it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I don't really have any uh, regrets. Big decisions have been made whereby I've been very aware of the consequences. Um, so an example of that was uh, when for many, many years I had uh, uh, agents in different parts of the world and they would find concerts for you and so on. And uh, however, you had exclusivity with those agents and also they, in those days, uh, would specialise in concertos and recitals. And I wanted to do other things, other types of collaborations, for example, um, just other things, you know, to keep myself buoyant because I f was finding myself just going round and round a little bit. And so I made a, a pretty big decision to forgo the agents and just basically manage myself with knowing that there would be far less concerts. Um, however, there would be the freedom to explore other territories. And that's exactly what happened. And, but it made me a much happier person. Um, and it made me, it, it, it created things that would not necessarily have happened. Uh, but of course, this was pre-social media and, and all sorts of things like that. So you have to think historically uh, about these things as well. Now, the whole landscape of managing somebody has changed. And, and, uh, and so we have to now open ourselves up to, to you know, where we are at at this point in time. Um, but, you know, this is just a few years ago. And so it's an example where things, you know, are continually changing and changing at quite a quick rate to be honest, and so it's very exciting, but it gives us all the more reason to listen to our young folk, um, you know, and listen to those who are supporting these people, and, and, and really, you know, having them here as part of a conversation, and, and what is it that, that music means to them, you know, what is it in their lives that makes them do what they do, and how might they see this uh, moving forward in their situations, how might they see the, the industry in a hundred years' time, how might we, we be listening in a hundred years time what will be on our stages in our hundred years time how will we how will we will we be interacting with our um, technology our, our phones and whatever else or will it be something that we're looking at will it be something that we trigger by tapping our head you know or our knee or or whatever we don't know, but it's all possible actually you know might uh, just moving my big toe trigger something off. We don't know, and, and it's, it's a fascinating time to be in, but it's all the more reason to listen to each other. Does that make it easier to persuade children and young people not to be fearful 
of mistakes. And that, that were the question being raised that often children are fearful about telling their stories or, or performing music. I mean, how, how do you allay those fears and, and allow youngsters just to embrace it? it? It has to be embraced. You know, this is part of the reason why the Sounds of Science project is important, because this is a project that can go on and on and on. What is the sound of my community? What is the sound of my home? What is the sound of my school? What is the sound of my journey to school? What is the sound of my playground? You know, what is the sound of my kitchen? Whatever it might be. And, and think, about right, what might the sound of my community be in 50 years' time? Or how do I want the sound of my community to be in 50 years' time. So it's really, you know, allowing them to have those conversations. It's, it's so important. Those conversations don't always have to come through a musical instrument and then for us to say, oh, she can play, but he can't, or, or, or you know, that's really good, but that's, that's not really good. You know, it's not about that at all. You know, it's, it's what you were saying, that it belongs to us all, you know, in whatever capacity that is. It, it's a meaningful thing to us all. We just have to have that um, belief, that root, that opportunity, and have that listening platform. Gentlemen there. I've been listening to you, listening and listening, and it seems to me Everything you're saying distills down to one really great idea, which is that music brings benefit to us as humans. So going on from the question that you just pondered yourself, how will we be listening to music in a hundred years? My question is, how important now is it that, mu is it that music is composed by humans? Music is. How, so, impo how important is it that humans, uh, that music is composed by humans? In other words, oh. in, in other words, AI, should we embrace it or be terrified? <laughs> this sounds like an all, a, 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 an in conversation all to itself. But it, it is. how do we, how do we deal with AI? Do we embrace it? Do we? Try to control it. What's the? Well, we're we're kind of involved with it already. You know, I mean, years and years and years ago, I know that some of my recordings were used and and um, used as backing tracks for this and that. You know, without my knowledge and um, or uh, looped and and all sorts of things. And and that was quite surprising when it it happened. You know, and I was fairly ooh, you know, uh, a bit indignant about it and and whatever. Um, I think the important thing message I would uh, put forward is that music is about emotion and uh, and that really comes from us human beings it really does so all of the nuances um, that that comes from music making um, is that's what makes us unique and it, it's what makes each one of us you know you can line up uh, 10 snare drums of the same make, the same size, the same model, you name it, but have 10 different players playing exactly the same thing, and it will be, you know, that nth of a difference each time. And that's special, you know, that is what, what's so extraordinary about us. So I would always feel that there is space for the human being uh, to compose, to create music, to connect with music, um, technology will obviously play a part, of course it will, um, but I think that there has to be this realisation that what we uh, create is valued and protected. Um, it has to be protected um, and it has to be rewarded accordingly. Uh, people's creativity doesn't just sort of, you know, it's not there for people to, to pick off like, you know, apples on a tree. It has to be acknowledged and... Um, and, and yeah, it, it, it has to be respected, and it's that that is used then as inspiration uh, moving forward, you know, for the next generation and so on. So um, that's why, you know, when you see someone play, it's quite different to even just watching them on the computer. I think that's what we missed during the pandemic, is that we didn't get this physical feeling of sound. 
you know, uh, you know, when you see a violinist play and you, you just see how that violin is rest, the, the, the face is resting on the instrument or the, the rosin from the bow or just everything or a percussion player and, and feeling that sound is, is a very different sensation. Um, and we need to protect that, value that um, and, and make sure there's a, a platform for that always. I've got a sneaky hunch we're going to return to this in future festivals of politics um, in its wider sense. Right, we've probably got time for a couple, maybe three more questions, if the questions are reasonably brief. I've got the lady at the second row back, and then we'll come to the gentleman in the back row. Hello. Um, my late father was brought up in the northeast of Scotland, and he was a body ballad singer. He was also a prisoner of war with the Japanese during the Second World War. He died when he was nearly 87. And we were told by somebody who knew him then that when he sang in the camp, everybody stopped, including the guards. And I also believe that, you know, he was a farmer, he sang at his work. And I think that was one of the ways that he, that helped him to heal in the days when he came back. So I think that what you're saying about music being an essential part of our being was very much the thing for my dad. Absolutely. I think that reinforces the point about the daily medicine as well, I think, isn't it? It's... Yes, it is. And, and I think that is exactly, as you say, the power of music it, is that it can be placed in so many situations, sometimes uh, planned, sometimes unplanned. And, uh, and I think that, that that's what makes music so special. Um, you know, the other day we had a, a, a little girl who came to visit us uh, where I'm based uh, in, in Cambridgeshire and uh, her, her music teacher had written to us and, and said that this little girl is, is getting bullied at school at the moment and she's the only one that's wearing hearing aids and so, you know, she's, she's um, getting a little bit of a hard time. And so she just felt that, well, maybe just having a little five minute exchange or something together might make a difference. So she came through the door, literally cowering behind her, her mother, not saying anything. And by the time she left the building, she was leading the adults. Now she left saying, okay, I may not hear as well, but I'm a very good listener. And what we just worked on was listening to the resonance of sound. So striking something, so someone might say something not nice to you. But then if you just slow that body down and listen to the resonance, it gives you time to think about an action. So rather than being reactive and saying, how dare you say that to me, is let that go, let that go. And then you can make your decision thereafter. And it made all the difference to her. I mean, this is why we, we listen to the acoustics, and the acoustics really is our instrument, you know, not the, 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 the cello or the violin or the, the marimba or whatever. It is what the room and how the room carries that instrument. And in a way, that's what listening is all about. It's just giving the space to listen to the acoustics of, of listening. And so she just literally left, you know, where she knew that she could listen, even if her hearing is something that could be measured, but the listening was something that she could really control. And that just changed her whole way of moving forward and dealing with situations. Um, and so that wasn't about, you know, playing percussion or finding, you know, oh, let's play this rhythm together and, and, and that kind of thing. It was just literally dealing with sounds, with interaction, listening with each other, etc., etc. Um, 
And so, so what do you call that? Do you call that music? Do you call it sound? Do you, what do you call it, you know? So, um, so yes, it, it is incredibly important how we can manipulate um, in the nicest possible way sound music to the situations that we're, we're, we're in. Go to the gentleman in the very back row there. Hello there. How are we doing? I have been enjoying the plethora of well-spoken Scottish accents here, pronouncing T's and words like water. I think you might be able to um, shine a bit of light on something that could be um, really beneficial, not just to myself, but to others, which is um, your comment there about um, looking for the next Lang Lang and that guy that got put on that television show the piano where I got trained by Lang Lang how wonderful but something came up for me that became really really clear which is socio-economic background and your life circumstance Allah with family and so on and so forth seems to really really determine how accessible the creative industries and music is for an individual I have a lot of friends who have came through a very similar situation as me as of two. Despite being creatives and musicians, we were never able to um, cooperate with the academic music world. And this is for a lot of reasons, from the, the language to the lack of um, just edu how education is um, delivered to people who are in a situation where it is not of the culture that they are brought up in to cooperate within those confines. So for somebody like me, I find it very difficult to understand where I should go next. I have all my work, I can do all my shows. However, my understanding of the music world has not been academic. It has not been um, operas at the Usher Hall and so on and so forth. It has been nightclubs, it has been raves, it has been music festivals, it has been long nights at five in the morning seeing human society at its best and at its worst. And this is wholly removed from what I've been observing of the academic music world. And therefore, I find it very difficult to meet people or to understand where to network from someone who's coming from outside of that circumference, because I'm in my little flat that's far, far outside of Edinburgh or anywhere in my, what is um, called a deprived area, apparently, which is suits well for me playing my piano and making all of my songs and all my music all day, but getting into the town, knowing where I should go, or feeling comfortable to go, oh, in fact, why don't I just go speak to the university? Why don't I go see these people? Oh, they wouldn't want to speak to me. I'm, I'm a grotty chav to these people. Uh, they might not even understand my accent. Uh, and I quite quickly would alienate myself from it and don't feel comfortable to know where to go or where to start. So I'm wondering, for someone who has travelled around um, what is your advice to people like me? Well, thank you very much for, for that question. And it's interesting that you pick up, up on the fact that perhaps we're, we've been emphasising on the academic uh, journey of, of music. And, uh, and I think it is important to, to know, as we've uh, said really all, all morning, that music does belong to us all. The very fact that you've, you've got a piano in your, your flat and the fact that you are able to go to all of these different uh, musical experiences, raves or, or whatever it might be, is really, really crucial. And the fact that you are here is absolutely valuable. Um, and and that's, that's really important that, that we're able to express, you know, what, what your feelings are. And, you know, it is interesting what you're saying, because I think that there's possibly, and through uh, technology, through social media, through uh, the means that we can reach out to different people, is to express almost what you have just said, uh, and that question that you, you have asked, well, how can I connect? But you know what? One of the things that you do as a young professional musician, uh, you know, we're not far removed at all. In fact, we're probably in exactly the same place where we, we think, oh God, you know, how do I go up to that person and say, oh, uh, hello, um, I'm Evelyn and this is what I do. And, uh, you know, we, we think they're not going to listen. And, uh, and so we all have that kind of um, insecurity in a way. That, that's, that's perfectly natural. Um, but like everything else, it needs to be practiced. 
you know, we, we've just got to make that step to go up, you know, go backstage and say, oh, hello, and if somebody ignores you, they ignore you, and, and that's that. But the point is that you have done your bit by going up, and, and I think that once we get used to that feeling of approaching people, you know, and, and just, just saying to them, what, you know, what you have just said very passionately, it, 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 that means an awful lot, you know, it really does. And I will remember what you said when I walk out of, out of this building and I'll think about what you said. So even if you feel as though something hasn't actually uh, come back to you at that particular point. You never know how that person that you have met is actually going away and feeling. So don't always think that, you know, there's just this blank face uh, that is, is, is come your way. So um, I think that it, it, that happens to us all, and it, it happens to many people, you know, in, in all different kinds of professions. Um, so you know that you can step in to a situation and say your, your piece, you know, say what you're feeling. And that's, that is incredibly powerful. That is something that you should feel really, you know, proud of, very positive of, and we're all listening, you know, we really are. Um, but it is something that even, you know, as a seasoned, seasoned professional, I don't always feel comfortable going up to somebody and saying, oh, uh, you know, uh, Hi, and, and oh, by the way, you know, you might want to listen to this, or oh, this is what I've been doing lately, might it interest you? I find that very difficult to do myself. Um, I prefer other people doing it, but sometimes I have to do it. And ba bum, that's, that's just part and parcel of, of, of what needs to be done, you know. So, whatever you do, don't become the victim here, you know, don't get used to poor old me, you know, keep, keep going with these steps um, that you've done. So, today, what you said is really important, really powerful, and, and keep making sure your voice is heard. Thank you very much indeed. I'm afraid we have. I think now going beyond the time I was supposed to start winding up. So can I thank you all uh, very much indeed for your participation in this in conversation. Um, can I thank also um, our partners, the Edinburgh International uh, Festival, and in particular our BSL interpreters for today's event, uh, Shona Dixon and Heather Graham. Thank you very much indeed. Um, can I take the opportunity to remind everyone that the festival continues until Friday, including a discussion on how to disagree agreeably at 1.45pm today. I, I refer back to my point about earlier plugs being acceptable. I'm uh, chairing that event. But there's also an in-conversation uh, with the broadcaster and politician uh, Michael Pertillo tomorrow, tomorrow, followed by a discussion on the future of Scotland's arts and culture, amongst uh, other events. And finally, closing the Festival of Politics um, partnership with the Edinburgh International Festival series of talks on where we go from here. There'll be an in, com uh, in conversation with one of the world's foremost music uh, conductors of today, Gustavo uh, Dudamel, on Friday the 25th of August. But can I conclude by offering um, a particular thanks to Dame Evelyn Glenny for uh, being so generous with her time, so thoughtful uh, in her responses. Um, I will certainly be listening to my inner babble um, more often um, as we go forward, but can I ask you in the usual way to show your appreciation for Dame Evelyn Glenny? Thank you.